A new model by OpenAI, it helps you convert text to video. How does it work? When can you use it? And what challenges does it pose? Tonight, we'll discuss how this has the potential to bend and break reality. In other news, Alexei Navalny is dead. The most famous Putin critic was in jail. The West says he was murdered. We'll tell you what Moscow says. Also, is Russia deploying nuclear weapons to space? What will it entail? Why India is building a military base in Lakshadweep? What's the message New Delhi is trying to send? Why thousands of people are making a beeline to leave Myanmar and enter Thailand? Why the US has deployed a record number of warships in the Western Pacific? Why Somalia is getting five new military bases and what it means for the Horn of Africa? Greece has legalized same-sex marriage. Why is that significant? What is doxing and why is Australia banning it? And what's the cuteness market that is taking over the world? All this and more coming up for you. The headlines first. Senegal plunges into more chaos. Its election authority overturns the president's decision to delay elections. The council calls for election to be held as soon as possible. President Macky Sall had postponed the polls, which were to be held this month to December. Gazans should not flee to Egypt, says the United Nations refugees chief. Nearly one and a half million displaced Palestinians are in Rafah, which borders Egypt. Cairo is already building a fortified buffer zone near its border as fears mount of an Israeli ground invasion in Rafah. In India, opposition Congress party gets relief from the tax tribunal. Income tax authorities unfreeze the party's bank accounts. Earlier, Congress claimed its accounts were frozen, impacting its political activity. A final decision on this is likely to be taken next week. Germany and Ukraine sign a bilateral security agreement. Last month, Kiev signed a similar deal with the United Kingdom. President Zelensky is expected to seal a deal with France as well. Kiev is looking to shore up long-term support as its war with Russia nears the two-year mark. And European Union watchdog urged to reject Meta's pay for privacy scheme. It allows users to pay to opt out of data tracking. Civil rights groups say the policy violates EU law. Since November 2023, Facebook and Instagram users in Europe have been able to buy subscriptions to stop targeted advertising. Before you get excited, no, this is not an AI-generated video, but very soon it could be. Because OpenAI has just unveiled its latest product. It's called Sora. Now, the word, the word is derived from Japanese. It means sky. And what does it do? Sora can create videos based on your text prompts, like the one we just showed you. OpenAI has given some examples. We'll show you the prompt and then the video. A movie trailer featuring the adventures of a 30-year-old spaceman wearing a wool-knitted motorcycle helmet. Now, that's very specific. I'm sure no such video has ever been shot. So let's look at Sora's output. Quite accurate. Let's look at another example. This is what the prompt said. A stylish woman walks down a Tokyo street filled with warm, glowing neon and animated city signage. She wears a black leather jacket, a long red dress and black boots and carries a black purse. Again, very specific. Take a look at Sora's output. That was an AI-generated video. Let's tackle the obvious question here. How is Sora doing this? Through machine learning. Sora is basically an AI model. It has been trained on possibly tens of thousands of videos, maybe millions. So the responses are based on those clips. Let me explain with another example. This is the prompt. Two golden retrievers podcasting on top of a mountain. Look at Sora's output. Sora has basically merged different videos in its library. It has videos of golden retrievers. It has videos of mountains. It also has videos of podcasting. 
So the output that you see is a mashup. It has learned from those clips to generate the output. But sometimes it can go wrong. Let me show you another prompt. Step printing scene of a person running cinematic film shot in 35 mm. Now look at the output. Clearly, that's impossible. You can't run backwards on a treadmill. But such glitches aside, this is very advanced technology. Think of all the uses. You can make stock footage from Sora. You can use it for storytelling, in video campaigns, even in news stories. All of this makes Sora a very consequential tool. So when can you use it? Right now, Sora is not available to the public. Only some creators and researchers can use it. Also, there are restrictions. The videos are limited to one minute. Plus, no sexual content, no violence, and no celebrity likeness. But we say that's hardly enough. We have gone past the realm of funny chatbots. This is now bending reality. People may dismiss fake news claims on social media, but what if that claim is backed by pictures or videos? Maybe a politician taking bribes, or communal riots, or celebrities doing something wrong, or maybe something as simple as an alien spaceship. It could amplify that fake news. Of course, AI models have some guardrails. They won't let you make videos or pictures of celebrities or politicians, but that alone is not enough. There are many unregulated models out there, those willing to bend the rules. And we've seen examples of that, like fake robocalls by US President Joe Biden or fake porn images of Taylor Swift. So what's the solution to these problems? Well, tech companies say they're on it. A global accord is in the works. It attempts to limit disinformation and fake news from AI. And how will it do that? Among many things, with a watermark. If every AI image or video has a watermark, you can distinguish them. Sora videos do have them. You can see the watermark on the bottom right. It's a stopgap measure until more rules come in, which raises the bigger question, where does AI go next? Well, you know the rule about technology, it keeps getting better whether you like it or not. Soon such AI videos may become indistinguishable from real ones. And when that happens, we need rules. Companies alone cannot guarantee safety in the age of artificial intelligence. Governments must take the lead. Whether it's watermarks or digital signatures or stricter terms of use, and the window is very small. Just think back to ChatGPT. It was launched in 2022, but now the market is filled with text-based AI models. There are many others who are doing the same thing. Chances are Sora will go the same way. Before you know it, similar models will be everywhere, which is why regulation is urgently needed. I know world leaders have a lot on their plate, but they would be wise to see samples of Sora. That should tell them how urgent it is. Alexei Navalny, he had many titles, Putin critic, Russian opposition leader, poisoned activist, but there's one that stuck, the man with many lives. That's what he was called. He ran out of them today. Alexei Navalny has died. He was in a prison in the Arctic Circle. We still don't know the exact reasons or circumstances of his death. Kremlin was asked about it. It says it has no information about the cause and that it's up to the medics to clarify. As far as we know, currently, in accordance with all existing rules, everyone is engaged in all checks, clarifications and so on. That is, there is no need for any special instructions, because there is a certain set of rules that everyone is now following. So Kremlin does not know how he died, but there have been a few reports. They all say the same thing. He was out on a walk in the prison yard. That's when he fell ill. And soon after he fell to the ground, medical staff were informed. They spent half an hour trying to resuscitate him, but they failed. After he and he died soon after. So basically, Navalny died from previous complications. That's the Russian version. But there's a video that's now doing the rounds. It's from the 15th of February, which is yesterday. In this video, you can see Alexei Navalny. He was appearing for a hearing. 
Your Honor, I will send you my personal account number so that you can use your huge federal judge's salary to fuel my personal account because I am running out of money and thanks to your decisions, it will run out even faster. So, send it over. He seemed perfectly healthy yesterday and today he is dead. How did that happen? It's the question that the world is asking. Russia says it's complications. Russian critics are not buying it though. The US says Russia is responsible. Ukraine says Putin killed Navalny. Spain has demanded clarification. The EU says Putin fears nothing more than dissent. And NATO says Russia has some serious questions to answer. Russia is responsible for this. We'll be talking to many other countries concerned about Alexei Navalny, uh, especially if these reports bear out to be true. I am deeply saddened and uh, concerned about the uh, reports um, coming from Russia that uh, Alexei Navalny is dead. All the facts has to be established and uh, Russia has serious uh, questions uh, to answer. Putin's Russia imprisoned him, trumped up charges against him, poisoned him, sent him to a Arctic penal colony, and now he's tragically died. Alexei Navalny has died in a Russian prison. It is obvious that he was killed by Russian President Vladimir Putin, as thousands of others, tormented and tortured because of this one creature. Multiple statements, but the same sentiment. They say Navalny did not die and that he was murdered by Russia. What about his family? His wife was at the Munich Security Conference when the news broke. She still got up on the stage. She was given a standing ovation. And this is what she had to say. You have all probably seen the terrible news coming in today. I thought for a long time whether I should come out here or fly straight to my children. But then I thought about what my husband would do in my place. And I'm sure he'd be here. He'd be on the stage. So who exactly is Alexei Navalny? How did he rise to prominence? And why was he called Putin's biggest foe? Navalny was born in 1976 in Butin. It's a village located just west of Moscow. His mother owned a factory. His father was a Soviet army officer. And that's what set him apart. Navalny was not like other opposition figures in Russia. He wasn't an oligarch. He wasn't a Soviet official. He wasn't from an ethnic minority. His ancestors once fought for the Red Army. He was born and brought up in Russia. He studied there. He worked there. He married there. His wife was Russian. Everything about him was so inherently Russian that he captured the public sentiment. It was difficult to make him look like an outsider force, to paint him as a Western agent. His political career began in the year 2000. Navalny joined the Russian United Democratic Party. In 2001, he was listed as a party member. By 2004, he was deputy chief of the Moscow branch. But in 2007, he was expelled from the party. Why? Because he demanded the chairman's resignation, so he was thrown out. But Navalny did not give up. In 2007, he launched the National Russian Liberation Movement. But it was in 2008 that he became a household name. He exposed corruption in state-run corporations. By 2012, Navalny was arrested. It would be the first of his many arrests. The same year, he rallied thousands of supporters, all protesting against Putin. He called Putin's party a party of crooks and tugs. In 2013, he ran for the mayor of Moscow. He came second with 27% of the vote. He was under house arrest for two years. He was attacked with a die. It caused some eye damage, but it wasn't the only attack he would endure. In 2020, Navalny traveled to Siberia. It was to shoot a video on corruption. On the flight back to Moscow, he felt weird. He was dizzy. Soon he collapsed in the plane. The plane made an emergency landing. Navalny was rushed to hospital, but public pressure was mounting. Germany tried to evacuate him and Russia relented. So he was moved to Berlin. The medical diagnosis then said he was poisoned by a nerve agent called Novichok. Alexei Navalny wurde Opfer eines Angriffs mit einem chemischen Nervenkampfstoff der Novichok Gruppe. Dieses Gift lässt sich zweifelsfrei in den Proben nachweisen. Reports said Russian intelligence had poisoned him. Navalny himself carried out a sting, but Putin denied all of this. Russia was sanctioned. There was widespread condemnation. But even after the poisoning, Navalny did not give up. He recovered in Germany, but he could not stay away. 
So in 2021, he made a shocking announcement. He was going to return to Russia. Minutes after he landed, he was arrested and sentenced to 19 years in jail. Since then, he'd been in prison. Last December, his team said they lost contact with him. They did not know where he was. Weeks later, he was tracked to a prison in the Arctic Circle, thousands of kilometers away from Moscow. He has appeared for hearings from there, the last one being yesterday. But today, the man who was known as Putin's fiercest critic is dead. Navalny had long resisted the label of dissident. Yet today, he died as one. Meanwhile, we have more news from Russia. They are set to be deploying a nuclear weapon in space. That's right, a nuke in outer space. Says who? An American lawmaker. His name is Mike Turner. He leads an important committee of lawmakers. This week, he declared that the U.S. faces a serious national security threat. I have a quote. Listen to what Turner said. I am requesting that President Biden declassify all information relating to this threat so that Congress, the administration, and our allies can openly discuss the actions necessary to respond to this threat. Why are Americans so alarmed? There's a simple explanation for that. If Russia fires a nuke here on Earth, the US has a shot at defending itself. They can deploy countermeasures, they can launch counter strikes. But up in space, the Americans are defenseless. Not just them, all major powers are. No country has nuclear weapons in space. An international treaty bans such a deployment. It's called the Outer Space Treaty. But the US is afraid they fear Russia could disregard this treaty and launch nukes in space. If that happens, it will be a major escalation. Such a weapon could dramatically shift the balance of power. So what can a nuclear space weapon do? What can it target? An obvious target would be satellites. If Russia strikes US satellites, it could destroy civilian communications. Phones will stop working. GPS could fail. Military and space communications become vulnerable. American surveillance capabilities could be disrupted. A strike like that would set back any country by several years. It would cause immense damage to economies. The global financial system, you see, depends on satellites too, for real-time communication. So the damage would be wide-ranging. But for now, the White House says there is no reason to be concerned. I can confirm that it is related to an anti-satellite capability that Russia is developing. This is not an active capability that's been deployed. And though Russia's pursuit of this particular capability is troubling, there is no immediate threat to anyone's safety. There is no immediate threat, but Russia is actively pursuing this capability. That's the assessment of the U.S. government. Now, Russia is fighting a war. It is at the receiving end of thousands of Western sanctions. At a time like this, why would Moscow make this a priority? They already have anti-satellite weapons. They can take out specific satellites if they want to. Why do they need a space-based nuclear weapon? What would Russia aim this weapon at? Possibly commercial satellites, the likes of Starlink, which provide internet access from space. The service was started by Elon Musk, and Russia doesn't like it one bit especially after the Ukraine war began. During the war, Starlink satellites have provided internet access to Ukrainians. Russia sees that as a threat. They've been issuing open threats, in fact. In 2022, a Russian diplomat spoke at the UN. He said private satellites are, quote unquote, extremely dangerous and taking them out is fair game. In his speech, this Russian diplomat also declared that Moscow could, quote unquote, retaliate against them. But why not use the existing weapons? Because they, they may not be good enough. Russia's anti-satellite weapon can take out a single satellite, but services like Starlink use a network of satellites. So if Russia wants to disable them, they need the capability to take out the entire network. Is this what they're aiming for? What does Moscow say about these reports? The Kremlin has issued a denial. It has termed the American claims malicious fabrication. We hope that's what it is, fabrication. Both the US and Russia should think this through. They're already locked in a fierce arms race here on Earth. Launching a new arms race in space is the last thing anyone wants or needs. If one major power takes that leap, the other will inevitably follow, and it won't end well.
So AI is making videos, nukes are going to space. It's almost sounds like a sci-fi movie, but let's keep futuristic technology aside for a moment because our next story is about projecting conventional power. It's about military bases. Reports say India is building a new one, a new military base. And this new base is being built in Lakshadweep. Here's what we know so far. Next month, India's defense minister is heading to Minikoy. It's in the southernmost it is the southernmost island in Lakshadweep. Minikoy is around 400 kilometers from the Indian coast, but it's just 100 kilometers from the Maldives. And the, difference, the defense minister is not traveling alone. Reports say he is taking an armada. Two carrier task forces will sail with him, the INS Vikramaditya and the INS Vikrant. Put together, that's around 15 warships. Once there, the defense minister will inaugurate the naval base. It's being called INS Jatayu. The plan is to station naval assets there. Airstrips are also in focus. A new one is being constructed in Minikoy Island, and the airstrip in Agati is being upgraded. Agati is also an island of Lakshadweep. It is located further north. Now, just to be clear, the Indian Navy has not confirmed any of these developments. So right now, it's all reports. But as they say, there is no smoke without fire. So what is the strategic goal here? Why is India militarizing Lakshadweep? Let's pull up the map first. Minikoy is located near the Nine Degree Channel. Think of it as a narrow water body. It's around 200 kilometers wide and 2,600 meters deep. This channel is a very busy trade route. Goods worth billions of dollars pass through this area. And where do they go? To East and North Asia. Ships heading to China also take this route. So controlling it is very important. It gives India strategic leverage. We've already seen how important such choke points are. The Red Sea is one of them. And look how the Houthis weaponized it. That could be one reason for building this military base to control a key trade route. A second reason is China. Beijing is expanding its presence in the Arabian Sea. Last November, we saw evidence of that. China and Pakistan held joint drills in the northern Arabian Sea. Multiple submarines and warships were involved. And now they're targeting the Maldives. Mali's new president is pro-China, so Beijing is making the best use of it. Last month, they sent a spy vessel to the Maldives. Before that, they sent a couple to Sri Lanka. So India had to find an answer. It had to project power in the Arabian Sea. Looks like New Delhi has picked Lakshadweep for this mission. Prime Minister Modi visited the island in January. The local administration is expecting a wave of investments. Do you know how much money we're talking about? Close to 20,000 crore rupees. So the plan is not just military. The idea is to turn Lakshadweep into a prosperous outpost, a tourist hub plus a military base, and it's not a one-off. India is doing something similar in the Bay of Bengal as well in Andaman and Nicobar Islands. In 2019, the government set aside more than 5,500 crore rupees. The plan was to expand the military base in Great Nicobar. Again, the location is key. Andaman and Nicobar overlooks a very important choke point. It's called the Malacca Strait. It's located between Malaysia and Indonesia. If you sail from Europe to Asia, this is the shortest route, which means China is dependent on this as well. In 2016, Around 80%, 80% of their energy went via this strait. So India is building a base near it. What does that tell you? Broadly speaking, two things. Number one, India is fulfilling the strategic importance of these islands, both Lakshadweep and Andaman. Successive governments have been guilty of ignoring them. Hopefully that would change soon. And number two, India is openly projecting its naval powers. Last year, the Indian Navy held joint drills with the Philippines. And where did the drills happen? In South China Sea, in Beijing's backyard. And our big naval base inauguration is on the cards. If reports are true, expect fireworks. Because two carrier forces sailing together is a political message. It's a way of showing who's boss. Our next story is from Myanmar, and our focus is on the Thai embassy in Myanmar. It's overwhelmed. It's witnessing long queues, almost 2,000 people waiting in queues. They want a Thai visa, and they want to leave Myanmar, which ex what explains the sudden rise in numbers, you could ask. 
Last week, Myanmar announced compulsory conscription. The youth will have to serve in the military as and when they're called. Most of them don't want to do that. So they're fleeing the country. They want to escape before the law comes into force. Our next report tells you how Thailand could be dealing with a deluge of refugees in the coming months. It was a Friday morning, just another day in Myanmar. But not for the Thai embassy in Yangon. It had a snaking line in front of it. Young men, young women, all seeking visas. There were almost 2,000 people in line. So what explains the sudden deluge? Myanmar is bringing in a new law. The junta announced it last week. It imposes military service. Basically, the junta can call up anyone to serve for two years. Men between 18 to 35 can be called up. Women between 18 to 27 can also be asked to serve. It's called the People's Military Service Law. It will soon come in force. And that's what these people are trying to escape. When I heard about this military service law, I was shocked. I asked around whether it was true or a rumor. Most youths are scared now as we have confirmed it is true. This military service law is targeting youths. Youths in Myanmar have lost their dreams and this law makes them feel more painful, grievous and more fearful. Our future is already fading away. This law could be the greatest mistake of the military and it is breaking youths' dreams. Right now there are no details of who will be called up, of who will be asked to serve. But the youth isn't waiting for that. They are seeking tourist visas. That way they can escape to Thailand for a few months. Many say they don't even want to return. Some even arrived the night before. This was so they could start the queue at midnight. I'm thinking to start my own business and I have a mother and siblings to support as I'm the oldest son in the family. But when this military service law came up and our economy is already going down, if I have to go to the military, the whole family will be in trouble. The Thai embassy says it is issuing 400 numbered tickets a day. This is in order to manage the queue. But even that is not enough. Myanmar shares a 2,400-kilometer-long border with Thailand. Since the military coup in February 2021, many people have crossed over. Even after three years, the junta have failed to impose their authority. Fighting continues in large parts of the country, and it's only picked up pace in the last few months. That has left Myanmar's citizens with no choice. We are still studying and I think we are already too late to go abroad as we don't even have passports and now the military is putting restrictions on getting passports. At this point, young people are interested in going to the jungle and joining anti-military armed forces. Since the coup in 2021, thousands have been killed in Myanmar. 1.4 million people are displaced. Nearly one-third of the country's population is in need of aid. Thailand says the situation is yet to affect the country. But if refugees come in, they will be given humanitarian aid. At least 45,000 people have fled to Thailand since the coup began. The numbers will only rise in the coming days. How many aircraft carriers are too many aircraft carriers? In your enemy's backyard, even one. But tell that to the United States. Washington is deploying five carriers to the Western Pacific. It's an unprecedented move. The U.S. has a total of 11 carriers. So almost half of them will be in the Western Pacific, five out of 11. Let's look at the warships first. USS Carl Vinson is deployed in Guam. The USS Theodore Roosevelt is deployed in Hawaii. The USS Ronald Reagan is in Japan and two others are en route. The USS Abraham Lincoln and the USS George Washington. Like I said, it's unprecedented. The US has never deployed more than three carriers in the Western Pacific. So why now? To send a message. Washington is involved in two wars right now, Ukraine and Gaza. Both are largely funded by the US, but the money has dried up. The US Congress is holding up Joe Biden's aid request. How much money are we talking about? More than $95 billion. 
It includes aid for Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan, but chances are it won't be passed. So questions are being asked. Is the United States a reliable partner anymore? Can they depend on Washington to defend them? It's a major worry for East Asia. Countries there have two challenges. One is Chinese extremism. The other is North Korea's missile tests. So what does Joe Biden do? He flexes his military muscle. Five aircraft carriers is a lot of firepower because carriers do not travel alone. They are flanked by destroyers, frigates, and patrol boats. So multiply that by five. Biden is basically telling China, do not get ideas. But will it be enough? I doubt it. Warships and aid are not direct substitutes. Just ask the leaders of the Pacific Islands. Three of them have written a letter to American lawmakers, Micronesia, Marshall Islands, and Palau. They've together written a letter. Last year, they renewed a deal with the US. Washington would give aid. In return, they would get, get exclusive access to key regions. That was the deal. Just one problem, though. The aid has not come through. Around $2.3 billion has to be paid. This money has been clubbed with a $95 billion package. So this money, too, is on hold. And the Pacific leaders are not happy about that. Listen to what Palau's president wrote. Every day the aid is not approved, plays into the hands of the Chinese Communist Party and the leaders here wa who want to accept its seemingly attractive economic offers at the cost of shifting alliances, beginning with sacrificing Taiwan. The Marshall Islands president had a similar warning. I'm quoting again. Further delay threatens to undermine confidence in the U.S. and to encourage some to agree to PRC enticements. That's a very clear warning. Give us aid or we may switch sides. In China, of course, there is no Congress. If the Communist Party decides, payments can be fast-tracked. So aircraft carriers won't really help Joe Biden, at least not with the Pacific Islands. You need a checkbook here, not a hammer. Elsewhere, though, a hammer could work like in the South China Sea. A standoff is brewing between China and the Philippines. On Sunday, Chinese ships blocked Filipino vessels. Manila claimed their boats were tailed 40 times. In response, they deployed a warship. Then yesterday, another incident was reported. China claimed to have expelled a Filipino fishing vessel. Apparently, it was in Chinese waters. Such reports have become frequent. It has led to worries of a looming showdown. And if that happens, the U.S. could get dragged in. You see, Washington has a mutual defense treaty with Manila. It says they will support each other if attacked. The U.S. also has such treaties with Japan and South Korea. Both countries face threats from Kim Jong-un, hence the five carriers. It's basically Joe Biden's way of saying that he is not overstretched, that despite two wars, he can handle China. But like we said in the Indo-Pacific, the hammer alone won't work. Biden will need to use America's vast economic wealth as well. That is, if Congress lets him. You know, who sort of question and say, why are we working so much? You are saying the solution is not to question the system so much or the industry so much. The question has to be, don't apply. If that is your sort of driver in life, is that's your non-negotiable, as I like to call it, when you enter the workforce, then please look for industries as match it. Clearly, media is not for it. If I were to hire someone and have them talk to about, you know, not being able to work 24 hours, it would be really tough for that person. And even for me as a manager to sort of have them on board. Similarly, for startups, I mean, hustle has a different meaning altogether when it comes to startups. Uh, but talk to me a little bit about then how should young people really approach it? And is there a way in which people in existing organizations are feeling cornered, pressured, overwhelmed, exhausted? So I guess it depends upon your personal aspirations, ambition, how much you're willing to stake out at the job. And if, uh, if, if one is absolutely uh, clear that, look, I want to do this job only for, let's say, 48 hours in a week, 
uh, and I do not want to do anything more than that, then one has to be extremely prudent in the way they go about the selection process, ask the right question at the interview stage, uh, do some kind of a research about the organization culture before they get into it. Hmm. If you ask a patron, Now let's look at what the U.S. is up to in Africa. It is militarizing the Horn of Africa, building five new bases in Somalia, ostensibly to combat terror. Somalia has been fighting a terrorist insurgency. They're fighting against Al-Shabaab, a group with links to Al-Qaeda. Al-Shabaab has been trying to take over Somalia since the year 2006. They even captured the capital Mogadishu in the late 2000s. But in the past few years, they have been driven back. In 2011, they were ousted from Mogadishu. And the Somali forces have been narrowing in on them ever since, successfully pushing them back into their strongholds. A large part of the credit for this goes to an elite Somali commando unit. They're called the Danab Brigade. Danab means lightning. So the lightning brigade. These special forces were created in 2014. They were trained and equipped by the U.S., American troops do not officially fight on the ground in Somalia, but they work with this lightning brigade, coordinating strikes and operations to root out Al-Shabaab. And this lightning brigade has proved effective. So the U.S. is doubling down on the pet project. The Danab forces are headquartered here at an airfield near the capital Mogadishu. They also have bases in two other locations, and now they will get five more camps. A ceremony took place in Mogadishu today. Top U.S. and Somali officials were in attendance, including Somalia's president, Hassan Sheikh Mahmoud. And Molly Fee, the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs. Somalia's defense minister and the acting U.S. ambassador to Somalia signed a deal. The U.S. is building five new bases in Somalia and these, in these strategic areas. Look at the Al-Shabaab's areas of control again. It's clear that this is an effort to encircle the group. The Lightning Brigade will then move in on the remaining strongholds. Just the Lightning Brigade, though. These five new bases are only for them, not for the rest of the Somali army. And that may worry Somalia's neighbors, especially Ethiopia and Somaliland. Let's zoom out a bit and look at the map again. Somalia's biggest neighbor is Ethiopia to the west. Somalia also has a breakaway territory called Somaliland. Somaliland broke away and became de facto independent in 1991. But it is an unrecognized state. In fact, the largest unrecognized state in the world. And that could change soon because of Ethiopia. Ethiopia recently signed a deal with Somaliland on the 1st of January this year. Somaliland will grant Ethiopia port access. It will also lease a section of its coast to Ethiopia's navy. Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed desperately wants this. He's been drumming up tensions in the region because he wants access to the sea. Hence the deal with Somaliland. And what has he promised them? The details have not been made public, but reports say he will officially recognize the breakaway state as an independent country. Ethiopia will recognize Somaliland as an independent country. And that is a red line for Mogadishu. The port deal has caused an uproar in Somalia. There have been regular protests since the deal was made public. And now we have this push for militarization. Officially, Somalia's Lightning Brigade was formed to combat the Al-Shabaab. <coughs> I'm sorry. But these elite troops may turn their guns west as well. There are already reports of this happening. Last year, a battalion commander died in disputed territory near a town contested by both Somalia and Somaliland. He was a member of the Lightning Brigade. He was trained by American forces, and he died fighting against Somali land. Somalia says he retired a few years before this incident. But it shows that the Lightning Brigade can be a threat to all of Somalia's enemies, not just Al-Shabaab. And they're getting five new bases, which means there will be a lot more U.S.-trained Somali special forces. Good news for Somalia and for the fight against terrorism. But the situation in the Horn of Africa is delicate, and this risks further aggravating tensions.
We'll see how it plays out in the months ahead. Our next story is from Greece, home to one of the oldest civilizations in the world. This place of heritage has just taken a very modern turn. Greece has legalized same-sex marriage. Yesterday, the Greek parliament voted in favor of legalization. This was after two days of heated debate. Finally, MPs from across party lines came together. They passed the bill 176 to 76, making Greece the 37th country in the world to allow same-sex marriages and the first Christian Orthodox country to do so. Here's our report. Yesterday, Greece legalized same-sex marriages. After two days of heated debate, the Greek parliament pushed a new draft bill through. Discussions began on Valentine's Day and concluded with the final vote last night. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, a total 254 lawmakers have voted. In principle, on the draft law, 176 voted yes, 76 voted no, 2 voted present. Therefore, the draft law was accepted in principle by majority. A crowd had gathered outside the Greek parliament building. They had been watching the proceedings with bated breath, waiting for this historic moment. When the final tally was announced, the crowd erupted. Rainbow flags were waved, people were cheering and hugging each other. The joy and relief were palpable. It was a momentous occasion. It's a beautiful day. We've been waiting for this for years. I feel really good and I'm sure there are others who are just as happy as I am. I'm shaking right now. I'm sorry. It will go down in history. It was something that should happen. We are all very moved because we have been here since very early. What can I say? Greece is progressing slowly. Greece is the 37th country to legalize same-sex marriages. It joins a small group of mostly Western democracies, but it is also a pioneer. Greece is the first Orthodox Christian country to allow same-sex marriages. Orthodox Christianity is one of the religion's many denominations. It is mostly practiced in the eastern parts of Europe, in Greece, Serbia and Russia, among other nations. Senior members of the clergy are referred to as patriarchs, and many were staunchly opposed to the bill. The head of the Greek Orthodox Church even said it would corrupt the homeland's social cohesion. Some had even threatened to excommunicate lawmakers who voted for it. But despite this, the bill passed. MPs from across the political spectrum voted for the bill, and the Prime Minister celebrated the result. In Today is a day of joy, because starting tomorrow, another barrier between us is removed to create a bridge of coexistence and a free state with free citizens. What passed was a draft. The law still needs to be finalized and it isn't considered perfect. Same-sex couples can get married and adopt children, but they can't have a child via surrogacy. That right is still restricted to straight couples and single women. Nonetheless, the bill is still considered historic and it is being celebrated as a victory. Now let's turn our attention to Australia, where hundreds of Jewish people came under attack this month, not physically, but online. Personal details of about 600 people were shared on Facebook, including their names, images and professions. Who leaked them? Reports say pro-Palestinian activists. This incident has rocked Australia. The practice is called doxing. It's a form of online invasion of personal privacy. Doxing is when you release someone's personal information without their consent. It can have grave consequences. So Australia's government wants to outlaw doxing. Have other countries faced similar episodes? Do nations and online platforms have policies against doxing? And what can you do to protect yourself against it? Our next report tells you. Last year, hundreds of Jewish people in Australia formed a WhatsApp group. This included Jewish writers, musicians, artists and academics. Last week, a 900-page transcript leaked from the group. It included the personal details of about 600 group members, like their names, images and professions. The details were allegedly leaked by pro-Palestinian activists who then published the details on Facebook. 
Since the Hamas attack on October 7th last year, anti-Semitism has been on the rise the world over. Now, this latest case of doxing has rocked Australia. Doxing is short for dropping docs or documents. It's a form of online invasion of personal privacy. It refers to the intentional release of someone's personal information without their consent. This includes exposing the individual's identity or any private information, like their address, phone numbers, pictures or details about family members. It's usually done with malicious intent, to harass, humiliate or threaten. And doxing can lead to devastating consequences. This week, the Australian government said it will outlaw doxing. The government says new laws will strengthen protections against hate speech. The laws will impose fines on the perpetrators and issue takedown notices to social media platforms. Which comes as good news, because Australia's doxing episode is shocking. But it's far from being an isolated incident. During the anti-government protests in 2019, Hong Kong was hit by a wave of doxing. The government sought to identify protesters, while protesters shared personal information of police officers on social channels. During the same year, a South African journalist was doxxed. Her phone number was shared on X. It garnered millions of views. She reportedly received rape and murder threats. Since the war in Ukraine, many Ukrainian soldiers have also been doxxed. They received abusive messages. Their addresses were published online and their homes were reportedly broken into. So the cases are many, but regulation is far and few between. TikTok clearly defines doxing and bans it on the platform, but Facebook and X don't. The regulation differs across nations as well. In Asia, Singapore has outlawed doxing. Violators can be jailed for up to six months and fined about $3,800. After the doxing chaos of 2019, Hong Kong outlawed doxing as well. There's no law to punish doxing directly in India. But there are laws against voyeurism, defamation and stalking that can cover doxing. In Indonesia, a law can indirectly protect citizens as well. But doxing cases have been on the rise there. Because there are no clear guidelines that define doxing. Which is something the UK has. It doesn't outlaw doxing, but issues clear guidelines for prosecutors handling such cases, which are treated as cases of violence and threats. In America, the measures vary across states. Nevada and California ban doxing. So protecting yourself from doxing really depends on where you live. But experts claim many doxing incidents can be prevented. If users become familiar with privacy policies on online platforms, make it harder for people to track them online not publish personal details online, like phone numbers or home addresses. In an ideal world, the responsibility to prevent doxing should rest with those who violate privacy, and the responsibility to protect should lie with governments. But in the age of the internet, where poor regulation is rife, users must look out for themselves and unbox the docs to stay safe. The internet was invented in 1983 by a British computer scientist named Tim Berners-Lee. 25 years after his great invention, Lee was asked to name one use of the internet that he did not anticipate. Do you know what he said? Not virtual reality headsets, not self-driving cars. Lee answered with a single word, kittens. He said, I never expected all these cats. And Lee was not wrong. Who could have thought of this turn of events? It's been a decade since his response and cats are still conquering the world. Grumpy cats have become memes. TikTok has children acting like cats. Last year, NASA streamed a cat video from 20 miles away in space. 15% of internet traffic, 15% is reportedly driven by cat videos. Can you believe it? It's a truth universally acknowledged now that the web has been taken over by catharsis. Pardon the pun. But it's not the cats that are drawing people, it's their cuteness apparently. Cats hold the key, the key tenets of cute. Cuteness is unthreatening, it's adorable and therefore on the path to world domination. I'll explain. In this digitally saturated age, cuteness has become a prominent aesthetic. Think doe-eyed puppies, unicorn cartoons. Social media filters, toys, K-pop stars, even memes, at first glance, such images seem childish, but they're more powerful than they appear. 
and there is a psychological reason why. Scientists have been studying the nature of cuteness for decades. They say cute things activate the pleasure centers of our brains. They make us happy, calmer, compassionate. So cuteness comes in handy. In some cases, it is important for survival. When kids act cute, parents pay more attention to them. That's what studies say. And when pets are cute, they get more demands met. Cuteness can be good for nations too. During the Industrial Revolution, birth rates plummeted. So manufacturing of cutesy goods like toys and clothes soared, apparently to help people have more babies, to push people to have more babies. Cuteness also helps politicians. It can also disguise the unpalatable, like this picture of Hitler feeding a baby deer or a cuddly TikTok avatar of Indonesia's Prabowo Subianto. He used it in his election campaign this year, disguising his bloody past and boosting his votes from Gen Z. Cuteness also makes people care. When people are shown a cute picture, they're more likely to fill out a survey, sign a petition or offer to help. But more than care, being cute is great for consumption. We saw this in the Barbie movie where the cars are too small and the toothbrushes are too big. These details overloaded the audience with cuteness and contributed to the, to the movie's historic success, apparently. It earned $1 billion, more than $1 billion at the box office. Today, consumption of cuteness is a global phenomenon. It owes its origin to Japan. Japan has a culture of kawaii. It literally translates to cuteness. It started in the 1910s with cute stationery for schoolgirls. In the 1970s, this catapulted into a global sensation, the Hello Kitty. Back then, Japan was suffering from its first oil crisis, so Hello Kitty was used to sell more products, and sell she did. She appeared on towels, chopsticks, shoes, bags. Today, Hello Kitty is everywhere, and she brings in about $80 billion every year. This year, Hello Kitty celebrates her 50th anniversary. A giant exhibition of cuteness is being held in her honor, which makes us think. Cuteness can take many forms. It can be comforting, just as it can be manipulative. But whichever way you look at it, it's anything but trivial. So if you think you know cuteness, we say, think again. never ever seen anyone who's actually uh, very rarely to be honest had experienced a downside of putting in those extras and especially in the youth because I'm, this is essentially the approach I suggest to the youth all the time that uh, and in the process if you're learning picking up new skills you're in any case enhancing your employability all right so it's Friday and we're all set for the weekend we make plans with family and friends or just want to Netflix and chill in bed but suddenly you get a call from your manager saying that you have to pull in a few hours over the weekend. Or worse, after a night of partying, still dealing with a hangover, you get an urgent email on a Sunday morning from work. Nightmare, right? Well, this is a reality for a lot of us, me included. But not if you stay in countries like Belgium, Japan, Germany, UAE, the list is getting longer. Because here, in these countries, they have now rolled out laws or on the, are on their way of rolling out laws where people will not be obliged to respond to work calls or emails over the weekend. In fact, some are even doing away with the fifth working day altogether, meaning work only for four days. Others saying, let's make some arrangements and you have to clock in a particular number of hours and it's up to you in how many days you spend it. So you could wrap up work in three days or four days or seven. It's all up to you. Sounds And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. In DR Congo, thousands are homeless after the country's worst floods in 60 years. In the U.S., rescuers use an airboat to save a man trapped in icy waters. And in Peru, dogs bark, I do, at a wedding ceremony. Finally, we are taking you back in history. On this day in 1959, Fidel Castro seized power in Cuba. He defeated the forces of dictator Batista in the Cuban Revolution. 
Castro set up the first communist state in the Western Hemisphere. He led the country until 2008. We're leaving you on that note. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend. Welcome to CNN News 18 with me, Ayushman Jamwal, and this is the late night edition, ladies and gentlemen. We're getting a piece of breaking news. This is our top international story that is making waves across the globe where Western leaders are reacting to reports of Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny's death in prison. As outrage grows across the globe, Antony Blinken has said, and I quote, if these reports bear out to be true, his death in a Russian prison and the fixation and fear of one man only underscores the weakness and rot at the heart of the system that Putin has built. Listen in. Uh, we've uh, heard the reports from Russia of Alexei Navalny's death in prison. For more than a decade, the Russian government and Putin have persecuted, poisoned, and imprisoned Alexei Navalny. And now, 